Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Eat Tuesday. Let's see who's here. Fontini. I just realized now you are here already. I just realized now sitting here that um, sometimes you ask me when I'm going live. And so I thought I would beat you to it, but you are already here. So it is 2 p.m. Um, Fontini. I saw Sandy Huskisson is here. Good to see you, Sandy. I know exactly who you are. Petra Pele, welcome to you, and Marianne Anderson, good to have you, all the way from Sweden. Christopher Doran from America, good to have you, and let's see, yeah, Sandy, hi to you. Um, so this afternoon, I didn't expect to have crowds of people joining me today because of the subject, the power of pressure. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear about pressure. Nobody likes pressure. But unfortunately, pressure happens. And so it's what we do in those times of pressure that determine our progress in our walk with God. Janine von Skulkvek, welcome to you. Uh, Cecilia Bester Stoltz, welcome to you. Um, yeah, Tiger Valley. Okay, Cecilia Stoltz, good to see you from Tiger Valley. Your name is familiar. So I suspect that you have been to some of the things we've done at De Bron. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, if you have, or if you haven't, it doesn't matter. You're here right now. Welcome to you and Christopher, Dora, and always good to see you. Trusting God for strength for you and that you will have the power to overcome Cecilia Bester Stoltz and Janine know each other. What a small world, eh? Michelle Dorolingo, always good to see you. I cannot wait to see the ladies on the 6th of May. This is not an advert. It's just that it's been so long since we did an actual ladies' ministry morning. And um, this past weekend, I did a ladies' conference for a church that we, we, are, we consider, they consider us family, and so we consider them our family too. And so I did a ladies' conference for them, and it was amazing just to see the hunger of people and the openness to what God wants to do and that kind of thing. So I really feel we are in an exciting season of God giving opportunities. And I want to say this, and I believe it's a prophetic word for some of you listening today, if not all of you, is that there were connections in the past that you thought had ended. There were, you thought their purpose had run out. Because you know, God always has a divine purpose for a divine connection. You thought that had ended and you were not going to be connected anymore. Also, there were there are dreams in your life, in your life, in your heart, or you ha you've had dreams that you gave up on. And in this season, I really believe that God is giving us the faith to trust Him for those things that we went and we buried instead of planting. Sometimes we give up on something and we... I'm actually speaking about this on the 6th of May, so I'll, I'll give you a little preview. This is part of what I'm speaking about. Sometimes um, we go through things and, and we put our dreams... We think it's over. Those connections that were amazing before and we had favor and, and then we, we go and bury them somewhere because we think we have to bury it, walk away and expect something new. But God brings those things back again for a purpose. And so when you bury something, you dig a hole in the ground, you put it in the ground and you walk away from it thinking, I'm never going back to that again. I've got to leave it. I've got to forget it and move on. But when you plant something, and we are meant to plant the, the, the purposes of God, the promises of God, the dreams in our hearts are meant to be planted in fertile soil. And then we keep going back again to check if it's growing, if, because there's a purpose for whatever God promised you. And so there's a sense of expectation. And in my garden for the past 
four years, round about this time every year, um, some green shoots begin to come up in one section against the front wall. And they grow into this whole bush of snowdrops. And I think a few years, I was um, a few years ago, for a few years in a row, I was taking photographs of these little snowdrops because they perfectly form little flowers and I'm amazed by them. But they don't last for a long time. It's just a quick season and then they're gone. This season they haven't shown up yet. And I didn't do anything in that section of grass. It's like, where are you? So every morning I look out my bedroom window because I should be able to see them. And there's nothing coming through the grass. And I'm getting concerned. I feel a little bit disheartened that maybe their season ended. Maybe they were only meant to last for four years. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about them. But I'm really hoping that I'm going to see these green shoots coming through that sand and I'm going to have snowdrops again. Maybe it'll be May. Uh, it's normally during April, May. So they've got some time to come through. But I'm just praying that those snowdrops come up. But I'm telling you that because don't give up on the things that God has promised you and don't give up on the connections. You know, sometimes connections do come to an end. I'm talking about connecting with people um, for your purpose. But sometimes God brings those people back and um, into your life. And then you realize the season before that I thought was so great was just a time of networking, getting to know people better, getting to understand each other's hearts. And then they come back in a season of purpose and you're all ready for it. So somebody needed to hear that today. Don't go and bury things that were meant to be planted. The things we need to bury are the disappointments, the... Um, you know, disappointments in our lives, things that weren't of God and they were just good ideas that we came up with. We bury those things and we move on. And we don't keep going back to try and dig up the disappointments again. So today I'm talking about the power of pressure. So I'll read, I'm going to read a quote to you again. I found another Charlie Mackesy quote. Follow him on Instagram. And this is what, it's a, I've said this before, he does little an, drawings of a boy a mole, a fox, and a horse. And the book is called That in Some Order. I've probably said it wrong. But um, he got my attention with all these little um, drawings that he does before the book came, up, came out. And he got my attention because of the mole. <laughs> and the mole is the wise one. Just like in, you know, Piglet, um, Winnie the Pooh. Anyway, the mole is the wise one. And so, is there a mole in Winnie the Pooh? I don't think there is. There's a pig, there's Winnie the Pooh, there's a donkey, and there's a tiger. There's no mole. I'm thinking of um, Charlie Mackesy. So, just edit that bit out that I said Winnie the Pooh. So, so, this is what his quote is. Sometimes I feel I haven't done much, said the boy. You've gone up and carried on, said the horse, which is brave and magnificent. Go and look for Charlie Mackesy on Instagram and you will see his drawing of a horse and a boy having a conversation. And just just seeing that now, as I sat here getting ready to come on live, I was flipping through, not flipping, scrolling through Instagram and I saw that post. And it's just, you know, some people think, I'm just marking time every day. The pressure is too much. There's nothing happening in my life. But the important things are happening on the inside, not the outside. And here, when he, the horse says, today you got up and carried on, which is brave and magnificent. So you being here today, no matter how much pressure you have been through, under, or still feel the pressure from circumstances, you're still here today. So you got up, and you're still carrying on. So I want to commend you for that, and I'm sure God does as well. So the scripture in Hebrews 12 that says this, um, Hebrews 12, I will read it to you. And this is just a last minute addition to my message, but I've got to give you the scripture because you all know what it means. Uh, so let me get to the right page. Hebrews 12 verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, 
and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Who wants to hear about endurance? But unfortunately, we all need some endurance. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So whenever we go through pressure, if we can just have that, that image that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who are watching us, cheering us on. They see where we are running to. They see the race that's set before us. And we don't. We just feel the need for endurance. Now, I started thinking about this when it comes to pressure. That um, I had this, this thought the other day. When it comes to times of pressure in our lives, it could be uh, your pressure... Could, is probably different to my kind of pressure. Um, and maybe you're not feeling pressure at the moment, so you can just take notes and remember. Because pressure to me is not something that God sends our way. It's opposition from the enemy. Pressure is opposition against God's purposes in your life. And so we have available to us everything we need to be people who can endure and to be people who can get through the pressure and deal with the opposition and come out on the other side with everything we need. Now, when you go to gym, you don't walk into gym on the first day and pick up 20 kilograms of barbell and lift it above your head. You've got to, it, it's, you've got to learn how to operate this physical body of yours and do warm-up and stretching and then we start with the small weights until one day you realize you built some spiritual muscle and you can pick up a 20 kilogram barbell and you can do it without injuring yourself. But what we do as believers is we go for the heavy weights straight away. We get up, we get the promises of God that he gave us yesterday and we try and make it happen today. And we, we are behaving like these people who've got it all together. And you know, when God gives you a promise, you're not ready for it most times when he's talking about your purpose and your destiny. So we have to start with the small weights first. And this is the thought that I had. Um, the, be the best move, the most powerful move, our resistance move is when we lift our hands up and we praise. Resisting, worshiping God is our resistance against the opposition. Praising God in the middle of a battle. You've heard this before. Lifting up your hands, praising God in the middle of a battle is your resistance against opposition from the enemy. That God is not putting you in a horrible place, in a difficult place, so you can learn how to overcome. We have everything at our disposal to overcome. We don't need the circumstances to teach us how to overcome, but it's what we do in the circumstances of pressure that we grow as we overcome with God's help. You've got to get that right. So, um, let me read. Let's go to Ezekiel 47. And I, and I said, I read this last Thursday. I think it was Thursday. When, either Tuesday or Thursday last week. I spoke about, it, it was Tuesday, I think. Ezekiel 47 is when Ezekiel's taken and he sees this river flowing from under the door of the temple. And he, he can go in up to his ankles, up to his knees, and then up to his waist. And then as they moved forward, the, the river could not be crossed. By walking across it, he had to swim in it, which means he was out of his depth. But then it says in Ezekiel 47, um, verse 8, Then he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there. There's going to be life here, for they will be healed. And everything will live wherever the river goes. And then it says where, where the fish will go. Um, and then it says in verse 12, Along the bank of the river, on this side and that, will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month 
because their water flows from the sanctuary. That's the secret. Their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Now let's very quickly go to Psalm 1. Um, Psalm 1 says this. And you know what this says. Now this, I want to encourage anybody who's watching today, listening today, any kind of pressure you are under, this is going to be such an encouragement for you that you are going to be one of those people by the end of the session who's going to have joined the resistance movement. We are not people who just give up at the first sign of opposition. We are not people who just fall for the lies of the enemy. We are people who resist the opposition and be overcome with the help of God. So, Psalm 1. Uh, actually, I think I'm going to save Psalm 1 for just now. Let's not go to Psalm 1. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 12. Um, Philippians 3 verse 12. Yep, that's it. I'm working this new Bible of mine. I've got to turn the pages as much as possible. Uh, I've got to find Philippians chapter 3. Um, this is when, if you're in a live meeting and someone gets to the scripture before the speaker does, you can say, why don't you just read that, please? <laughs> um, okay, so what did I say? Philippians 3 from verse 12. Okay, let's read this. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. When I see that, he says Christ Jesus laid hold of him for a reason. What has he laid hold of you for? Your purpose. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this in mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Then it goes on. This is, this is what I really want to look at now. Brethren, verse 17, and sisterin, for the ladies watching today, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. In other words, we are the role model. Walk the way we walk. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. He's talking about people who walked before following Paul as a role model who've not, who have now given up. That they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. I'm not going to read that again. You can go back and read that again. But it tells me that people who once walked the way Paul walked and his followers walked had given up at some point and they had fallen prey to things because they, they did not endure. They didn't count themselves to have apprehended they didn't forget the things which were behind and continue to reach forward. You know, it's not, Christianity is not for wimps. <laughs> but, we say that often, but we are weak without the help of God. So maybe we are wimps. But in Him, we are strong. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So, so the people Paul is speaking about here in Philippians chapter 3 of people who have set their mind on earthly things. If you want to overcome in a time of pressure, you cannot have your mind set on earthly things because then you're going to give up. You can't have your mind focused on 
what is going on in the natural, who can help you in the natural, because those focusing on those things is not going to help you to press forward, to lay hold of that for which Christ has already laid hold of you. There's going to be no, there will, instead of that, there will be giving in to the pressure. The other thing that they do is he says here, they become enemies of the cross, his end is destruction, whose God is their belly. You know what that's saying? They've been driven by the appetites of the flesh. The appetites of how do I feel? What does my flesh need? How do I how do I feel emotionally about this pressure that I'm going through? And they find things to make them feel better and to satisfy them in this place of pressure. Instead of saying, God, Jesus laid hold of me for a purpose. I will endure through whatever I'm going through by keeping my mind on you and my hands lifted up in an attitude of worship. You know what I'm saying? And those things, these things that Paul spoke about, made these people, he calls them the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, I don't want to be considered an enemy of the cross of Christ because you know what he's actually saying. They deny the power of the finished work of Christ, and they gave up on that. Now, I'm not saying if you just feel doubtful one day and you feel anxious one day that you become an enemy of the cross of Christ. That's not what I'm saying. Paul's talking about people who've actually turned away from their walk with God. Everybody feels fearful at some point. Everybody's anxious at some point. Everybody's hurt at some point. But I want to say it's what we do with it. And remember that quote I gave you? It was not a quote from the Bible, it was a quote from Instagram, but he, he said, you got up and carried on, which is brave and magnificent. So the fact that you got up from your disappointment and you carried on is what God sees. Okay, so let's get into this. Let's have, let's, now we, let's go to Psalm 1. Let's, I said Psalm 1 earlier, let's look at it now. Psalm 1. Do you know that God's purpose for you and I, I read Ezekiel 47, but God's purpose for our lives is that we would live lives that bring healing to the nations. That, that people who don't know Christ would look at us and see the power of the cross in evidence in our lives. That even when we are discouraged, even when we are disappointed, we still get up and we carry on. And people in the world there cannot understand how we can do that and how we can have joy and how we can lift our hands and worship in the middle of a battle and they have nowhere to turn to nothing you know nowhere to go no one to turn to but we can still have hope and um, so our lives whatever we call to do in this life is meant to flow like a river of healing medicine to people out there just by them seeing the goodness of God in our lives and the strength of God and, and the character that we can walk in because we know God is with us. So I said to him to Psalm 1. Now, we are not these people. We are these people. We are not enemies of the cross of Christ. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. You know what it means to be scornful? Is that you will... Hear the promises of God. You will see people getting blessed. God will even come along and say, I want to bless you and I want to save your family. But we become scornful when it's actually mocking and we become critical and we, we can't hear about the goodness of God anymore. So we become scornful. It's like we turn up our noses at hearing about the goodness of God. In verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Here's another quick secret. If you want to have endurance, if you want to overcome, resist the opposition you're facing, meditate on the word of God day and night because the opposition is happening here. You've heard me say that before. And this is what will happen. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, not like a dead stick or a branch of a tree with no leaves on it, it says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, 
whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So when we avoid being the people who walk in the counsel of the ungodly, you know, those people in Philippians who, it says, whose belly is their God, and they set their minds on earthly things, those are people who have turned to the counsel of the ungodly to get wisdom from, um, you know, wisdom from some other source that is not God, to get wisdom from somewhere that is not the word of God. And also, they sit in the path of sinners. You know what the path of sinners is? What do you do in a path? You don't normally sit on a path. You walk on a path. So people who've turned their backs on the ways of God and who are facing opposition are walking the way that people who don't even know God walk in that way. Now, here, the reason I'm giving you all of this now is because, let me tell you what's happening. And I'll tell you what the enemy is trying to do. And then I'll tell you what God is doing. And then I'm going to give you some, some thoughts about how, what is happening during a time of pressure in your life and in my life. Um, people find themselves in churches. Now we're talking about Christians now. I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about people who have turned their backs on God. Because they've already gone where I'm warning you not to go to. People go to church and they serve faithfully and they're obedient to what God is doing. I've got light shining on me here, so you can just pretend that it is the glory of God. There's half a crown there, so this is just the glory of God. I'm not going to get up and close blinds. Um, it was nice and, and gray outside when I first started here. So, um, you can just receive the anointing now. So, okay, so people go to church. They turn their back, um, they, they're serving faithfully, and then there's a disappointment that sets in. The leaders let them down, or they feel stuck in this church, and they don't know what to do, or what's going on. And then they become offended with the church, and they leave the church. Now, we, I know too many people like this. They leave the church, and they say, I don't need to go to church anymore. I'm free. I've been set free. I've, somebody actually said this to me many years ago when they left church. They were in a position of leadership and everything. And then they, they had a big disappointment with other leaders in the church and they left. And they actually said to us, I have never felt so free in my life before. It's such a big deception. I mean, maybe you're in a church that's controlling you and then God says, get out. But this person left out of offense and major disappointment. And so um, they left. And then people who do that justify the reason why they feel so free. Because that church was wrong. Now I don't need church. I don't need other people to speak into my life. And it's a dangerous place to be because that puts us on the other side of, we, you know, setting our minds on earthly things. Where the natural things are what, what will make us feel better because we're not, you know, now we feel free. The other thing is um, pressure in a church is sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm talking about you as a believer sitting in a church. I'm not talking about people who lead churches because that's a whole other story. They have different opposition to their calling and different pressures. But you and I as believers, just belonging to a local church, you know, the pressure to you might feel like, I don't know if this church is going anywhere. I don't know if I can, if I'm receiving anything from this place anymore. And, and maybe God wants you to move, but we don't leave from one church to another just because we don't feel we need to be there anymore. We leave because God says go. And so a lot of people just get up and leave and then they end up, taking their hurts and disappointment with them from one church to another church. And they carry this thing like a bag over their shoulder everywhere they go. And they don't realize they're carrying this with them. But somewhere down the line, other people begin to see that this person has actually been hurt somewhere. It's God's intention that every single one of us receives healing because we're in a new season. There's healing for a new season. When God has planted you somewhere, when God has moved you from one church to another church, 
and this is where you've been planted and you recognize you can grow, this healing that comes for a new season. But the enemy wants people to live in this place where they just feel this disappointment and this hurt from everybody. And then what happens is when we set ourselves up like that, we actually cannot receive anymore we, um, until we get set free. So God wants you and I to live as people who we understand that pressure, when pressure comes, it's not, um, it's not meant to make us turn and run or to get our answers from someone else. A lot of people in times of pressure get the answers from Oprah Winfrey or, you know, someone like that who doesn't even serve God. They might use Christian jargon every now and again and sound spiritual. That These people are not born again. Our answers and our healing and our freedom and our deliverance comes from the Word of God. And having the right people in your life who can encourage you in your calling. And, in, and, you know, if you're not getting it in your local church and you want to grow in your ministry, find someone who you can relate to or follow them online or, or do something, read their books or something so you can grow but still be faithful in your local church until God says, okay, move. But this whole thing about people, there was a stage I remember a couple of years ago, not, not too long ago, where every, everywhere we went, people were just leaving churches. It was before COVID. They were just leaving churches left, right, and center and saying, oh, we'd rather just meet at home and we'd rather just, you know, be on our own with God and we feel so free. It was like a huge shaking in the kingdom of God um, coming from the enemy side. So we need to recognize this in this season that we need to be where God has planted us so that our lives can be healing to the nations. We can be like the tree planted by the rivers of water. And, um, you know, if, you know, maybe you're looking for a church that has everything that you think a church should have. There's no perfect church. Some people are looking for churches that will have the fivefold ministry in operation every Sunday. They're going to prophesy. They're going to teach the, the best word hot off the press. Everyone's going to get prayed for. You know, church is church. We have to be in a community where we can learn and grow and develop and, and love each other. And you're not going to love everybody. I just want to tell you that. So so the, the thing that God is doing in the midst of all of this is that maybe you can recognize this in your life. He's setting people free to be where they need to be in the local community, the local church, whatever you want to call it, because there's healing for a new season. God's people need to be healed of disappointments, of offense and hurts and things. And God knows this. And so God sends healing so we can walk into a new season as whole people who are free because we know that the power for our healing came in connection to a local community. And so let's have a look at um, Romans chapter 1. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. I hope you understand what I mean there. It's so important that, that you don't start saying, oh, I'm, I've left the church now, now I'm free. Of course you're free to do your own thing because nobody knows what you're doing. And it's a dangerous place to be. Romans chapter 1. Okay, it says this, um, verse 11, verse 11, this is Paul, he says, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Um, and then he says, Verse, let's get on to verse 16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, why I read that to you, I am not 100% sure, to be honest with you, Let's have a look at, now I know why. If we get to the end of Romans chapter 1, he starts laying out people who exchange the truth of God for a lie. This is what happens when we 
start out well as believers and we believe we have to go to church we believe we have to get involved we believe we need you know you know when paul said i long to see you that i may impart to you some spiritual gift he wanted to, um you can translate that um there's a phrase in there impart to you some spiritual gift and the spiritual gift one of the translations is deliverance from danger so Paul recognized that there was a whole lot of stuff going on here. You know what the book of Romans is about. We're going to look at it now. There was a whole lot of stuff going on around these people. And he wanted to come to them recognizing that he could impart, transfer over, help them, give them some help from, from spiritual help to deliver them from danger. And the danger was not wild animals, people beating them up. But it was spiritual strength and help that they needed to overcome what was going on in the behavior of people around them during this time the, when the book of Romans was written. And it says here, um, now this is none of you, but this is what happens to people who in a time of pressure give up and turn their back on the ways of God, thinking they're going to get the answers some other way. This is what is out there waiting to happen and I've seen it happen with people um, it says here professing to be wise it's Romans chapter 1 verse 22 they became fools when people think that they know better than God that God is the one you know Jesus is the head of the church the body of Christ so Jesus is the head and you and I are in there knitted together joined together working together Professing to be wise, they become fools. People think they know better than God. They change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Verse 25, they exchange the truth of God for the lie. Um, verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, a mind that doesn't think according to the ways God thinks, to do those things which are not fitting. And it goes on a whole lot of stuff. Verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, and it goes on. Now, these are people who are not interested in believing the truth of God and the truth of the Word of God is that they were given over to these things. Now you know that these things do not be belong in our life or our thinking or our speech, our behavior. These things are talking about people who have turned their back on God. But if we find ourselves in a, such a time of pressure where we feel, I don't know if I can get through this anymore, it's like, God has allowed this in my life. The pressure is just too much. And then we stop pressing forward to reach the goal. We stop seeing that there's a, a, a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. We, we stop going to the promise that we planted and expecting to see it coming through the ground. And we just turn our back on the things of God. And then we turn to worldly things. We set our mind on earthly things where there's no hope. All of this is a huge trap just waiting. Well, how do you think people backslide? Um, my brother, who is now in his mid to late 60s, got saved at one time, maybe 20 years ago. He would go to church with us, take notes, even spoke about going to Bible school. And then something happened that he got disappointed by Christians or something. I don't even know what it was. He stopped going to church. He stopped reading his Bible. He stopped talking about the things of God. And I just noticed he, he's just cold. He, he's, he's aware of God. He hasn't totally turned his back on God, but he's not serving God anymore. So I consider him backslidden. And... I know, you know, every now and again I go and I give him a little bit of a prod, you know, and, and he knows exactly what I believe because we believed the same thing at one time. But he allowed a disappointment or a hurt to get into his heart 
for seed to be sown that now I watch his life without trying, trying my best not to be judgmental, but I see Romans 1, activity in his life. And I know God can get him back. I know God will answer my prayers. And um, he's, he'll still speak to me about the things of God, but he's got so many arguments. And it all started with a disappointment. And so the devil's trying to trap people who are feeling the pressure of today's society, today's culture, today's be, having to be politically correct, what's happening with children today. People are under this pressure, trying to survive through it. And if we are people who give up in a time of pressure, all of these things are waiting just to jump on us so that this will become our behavior. Instead of being like a tree planted by the river, whose leaves will, you know, it'll bring forth fruit in its season. Whatever you do is meant to prosper. Whatever you put your hand to do, when God says do it, it's meant to succeed and advance and help somebody else and be hope and life to somebody else, including yourself and your family. So let's have a look at this. Um, pressure any kind of pressure exposes our faith. It reveals how much faith we have, and it reveals where our focus is. You know this. If you've been in pressure, any kind of pressure, trusting God for healing, there's this pressure, God, I need it today. There's this pressure to keep up financially in the world. There's this pressure to, for your kids to serve God. To maybe you're pressurized in your marriage. Maybe it's just spiritual pressure because you recognize that, the enemy is opposing the promises of God in your life. Whatever the pressure is, will expose your faith, how much or how little, and it will also expose where your focus is. And so in a time of pressure, we see our worst, but our best is also able to come out during a time of pressure. And that's what we fail to see. When there's opposition, our best um, equipment, our best strength, our strongest strength, um, whatever we've learned in seasons gone by, that is, is what's meant to come out in a time of pressure. And I'm preaching to myself now, in a time of pressure, it's not always easy to say the right things and put your hands up and worship God and resist the opposition. It's not always easy, but if we choose that way, that's when we get the strength that we need. Do you know, I heard someone say this the other day, I think it was Chris Ballerton. If we don't admit our weaknesses, we can't receive the grace because God's grace comes to help us in our weakness. If we don't admit or confess our sins, we can't receive the mercy that is there and forgiveness. If you just deny that you've done something wrong all the time, say, no, I'm right, you can't receive the mercy. So in other words, we have to say what we've done wrong, we have to say, God, I'm weak, I need your help, in order to receive his mercy and his grace. And so a lot of people are trying to be strong, trying to cover up what they've done wrong and live in denial. And so they're doing it in their own strength. And those are the people who fall into the trap of, I'm offended, I'm resentful because I've done this and God didn't come through for me. And all he needed was for us to say, God, I'm weak without you. I can't do this without you. Whenever I go and preach somewhere, and I've got all my pages of notes, and I've prepared and I've prayed, and I stand up in front of a room full of people, or a hall full of people, I stand there and I'm saying, God, please help me. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come and help me. Because all my notes, all my preparations, all my strengths and abilities are not going to help anybody out there to the degree that God wants people to be helped by ministry of the Word and the Spirit. So I have to rely on, God, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need you to help. I always say, Holy Spirit, thank you that you're going to come. You are the one who's going to take the words on this paper and bring them to life. You're the one who's going to whisper the direction of a meeting in, in my here, so I can hear, and I don't just stick to what I know to do, but I go, I'm led by the Spirit of God. We have to, if we want to receive grace in a time of pressure, we have to acknowledge that we need the help of God. And He wants to help us. He doesn't just want to give you wisdom. 
You know, James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him come to God. And he gives without fault finding. He gives it generously. Um, he wants to give us wisdom, but he also wants to give us strength and grace to overcome in opposition. I think the whole world is struggling under the pressure of trying to survive the, the past few years. And the world is, you know, like, digging themselves out of holes just to fall back again. But our eyes are on God, who says the kingdom will continue to advance. My people are covered. They've got the shield of faith up. They're covered. I posted this the other day. Um, God is raising up women and men, if they're men watching. God is raising up his people to be people who know how to carry weight. They know how to resist. They have authority in the realm of the spirit because they've learned the, the authority. They've learned how to overcome in the wilderness times. And they know the power of the cross. And they know the power of saying, it is written. So he's looking for people who know how to carry weight in the spirit and who will not bow the knee to pressure of the enemy. Every arrow that flies over your head, this fiery dart that comes from the enemy, we're not going to duck and dive. We're going to stand our ground and so we know that God, God's word is true. Every promise in his word is yes and amen, which means he's already said yes to the script in the scriptures to those things that we need. We have an inheritance in Christ. We have authority in Christ. We have the name of Jesus. And so God is looking for people who are not setting their mind on earthly things. Why are earthly things? Earthly things down here. They're not setting their mind on earthly things because we know our help comes from the Lord. He is. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know when you know the truth? When, when you know the truth, Jesus said you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And when we know him, we're not going to fall for the lies. And also when you know the truth, you know better. You know better than to expect the fiery dots to come and take you out because the word says it's opposite to that the word of god says um, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church the word says no weapon formed against you shall prosper the word says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in god for the pulling down of strongholds the word says a taste and see that god is good the word says he sent his word and healed them and so we have all of this in our mouths, in our hearts, at our disposal. And so when we know the truth, we are going to walk in the truth. And that's where our freedom comes from. Not just the fact that I got delivered today, I got healed today. Our freedom comes in knowing Jesus is the truth. And he's not a man that he should lie. You know Psalm 23 where it says he anoints my head with oil? That whole picture of having your head anointed with oil is so powerful because, like right now, because the light's shining, it looks like my head's been anointed with oil on the right-hand side. Yeah, so, so um, as I said, that's, that's the anointing, that's the glory of God. So, um, the shepherd would take this oil and rub it on the, the sheep, the head of the sheep, not the sheep of the head, the head of the sheep, rub this oil in, because the sheep could not get up there and scratch its head. Um, and so that anointing would protect the sheep from those little parasites and mites that would creep in there and cause infections. And it's exactly the same with you and I today. He anoints your head with oil, just sitting in his presence. The anointing destroys every yoke of oppression, destroys every yoke, every lie, every um, every bit of opposition the opposition is still there but we realize this is a lie the truth and when you know better you will do better you will actually behave like someone who walks in the truth so let him anoint your head with oil today so we are set free to do the truth when we know the truth if you don't know the truth if you don't believe those scriptures i just quoted when the pressure comes you're going to fall into the trap of self-pity hopelessness, discouragement, which leads you down that horrible path of God doesn't do anything for me. He only does it for other people. So pressure wants to do that in your life. 
make you see, think that God only helps other people. Now here's a scripture. I'll read these scriptures to you. I wanted to tell you about a woman. You know the woman. Let's do this quickly. The woman in... I said this to you. Pressure is opposition to the purposes of God. And so the, the opportunity when you're in a time of pressure, when you recognize that God is opposed, the enemy is opposing something God said in your life, something um, you trust in God for, there's this opposition. When you recognize that, then you begin to, to say, God, I have authority. I have the name of Jesus. I'm not going to fall for this opposition. But in, in the book of John, no, I want to say this to you before we go to John 4. We either live by our circumstances or we live by how we stand. And your circumstances are going to send you a loud and clear message of how your life is just going downhill. Your prayers are never going to be answered. You're never going to get this. You know, God's forgotten about you. Your circumstances, if you set your mind on earthly things, that's the picture you're going to get. But if you continue to press forward and reach towards the goal for that which Christ has already laid hold of you, you're going to see the truth that God, God's promise is going to come to pass. So we either live by our circumstances or our stances. That word circumstance I broke up into two. Our stance, our position, how are you standing today? Knowing the truth will help you to stand. And you will not live according to every circumstance that you see with your eye. You live according to every word spoken to you. We live according to the word. Our faith is in God. So there was a woman in John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And this woman... I think I should speak to you about her on Thursday. You know, the woman at the well. I, I'll say this to you and then I'll speak about her on Thursday. That your pressure could be the place where God wants to turn your life around. It could be your well encounter. There's so much in that one message. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that now. Or what I will do is I'll do a short, a short video about the woman at the well. Let me give you a scripture because I'm looking at time here. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So there's a transformation that's taking place in our lives. Romans 9.23, and you have to read 22 first, but it says in... Romans 9.23, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Talks about God's glory being revealed in us. But also talks about some transformation that's taking place too. Now, here's an interesting scripture. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. says this, um, let's actually, I just want to see Romans chapter 5. I'll start from verse 3. It says this, and not only that, you can read what the other bit is, not only that, you can read that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So here it says, we glory in tribulations, and the word tribulations is also the word pressure. So, can you honestly tell me that every time you feel some pressure in your life, that you glory in that. And you know what it means to glory in tribulations? It means we rejoice. We're actually happy about it. It's like the book of James. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Who on earth counts it joy when they hit a trial? When there's opposition? When you trust in God for something and it just never seems to materialize? And it's something that's written in the Word. Are you going to rejoice about it? We're supposed to. And the reason James says that is because... 
and also here in Romans, the reason we glory in tribulation and we count it all joy is because in those times of pressure or tribulation, that's when we yield to God and we see the power of God in operation. I said just now, if you don't admit your weakness, you can't receive the grace. So in a time of pressure, if we continue to say, oh, God's allowed this now, he's allowed this pressure in my life, because we read the scripture in Romans and we get it back to front. We say, oh, well, God wants me to have perseverance. He wants me to have, um, what does it say? He wants me to have perseverance. He wants me to have hope and character, so he must have allowed this. But I'm going to read this to you in another way. It says here, firstly, I'll give you this. We glory in pressure. That word means to boast, to glory, to joy, to rejoice. We boast in the time of pressure, knowing that even the enemy is going to see God come through for us. This is, we can boast about the goodness of God in a time of pressure. That's all part of our resistance workout. When we begin to worship God, and we begin to say, God, I'm feeling the pressure here. I'm feeling the heat of the battle. But God, I worship you because you are my deliverer. You are my provider. You are my healer. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You are the truth. And we begin to boast about who God is in the middle of a time of pressure. We know we're going to see God come through. Then it says here, um, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, character, and hope. That word produces is very key here because it means um, it works out, it accomplishes, and it causes, and it fashions. In other words, it forms. So the pressure is actually doing something in our lives it's causing the things that we have in Christ to be produced. And I heard somebody explain, this, explain it this way many years ago, the scripture. Know, uh, knowing that tribulation produces so, certain things. That word produces is like a production line in a factory where things are being uh, produced and put on a, on a line and they sent out from the factory. So in a time of pressure, if we firstly know the truth, God hasn't put the pressure on us. It's the opposition against the purpose of God. So we stand in the time of, uh, and we begin to worship God and we boast because now we're going to see God come through. It's like David running to Goliath. I spoke about him the other day. He ran, he hastened to stand in front of Goliath, and he said, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. He was boasting about who God was. He knew he couldn't do it without God. And so we stand in a time of pressure, and we worship him, and we begin to rejoice, because in a time of pressure, God comes through. And so as we do this, these things are actually being produced in our lives. Perseverance, character, and hope. Then it says here, um, oh, okay, so, so, in every time where we feel the opposition, we need to see that we already have these things as a believer in Christ. We already have joy, uh, hope. We already have character, remember? We already have perseverance. All of these things belong to you and I as believers. They're, they're written into our spiritual DNA because God knows we need them in order to overcome the opposition. So read that in a different way next time you read that. We glory in tribulations. We're going to boast now in our time of pressure. We're going to rejoice because this is the time when we're going to see God. We're in the time when you need a miracle and you sit down and you get your focus on earthly things, where am I going to get more money from? Should I get a loan from the bank? Now, if God tells you to do that, it's fine. If, then you obey what God says. But maybe he's saying, trust me for a supernatural breakthrough. And then your, mind's, your mind is not on earthly things, it's on God, the way, the truth, and the life. And then he gives you the answer. And then in the time of pressure, while you're waiting for your provision, you're worshiping him. And you know what's being developed? Character, perseverance, and hope. Because the next time you go through some pressure, you'll realize, I've been through this before, this feels familiar. My hope is in God, my character, I can stand Character in, in pressure is so important because character means maturity. It means you're not going to get upset 
and resentful and blame God for everything, you're going to stand knowing, God, you've, you're with me in this thing. I'm going to worship you until I see the breakthrough because your word is true. All your promises are yes and amen. So character means we're going to be mature about this thing. We're not going to, you know, get in the flesh and start moaning about church and God and blaming everybody else and, and you know, moaning and crying. We're going to be able to stand in faith. People of character do that. And also people of character have integrity. They follow through on what they say. God has integrity. When he says something, he's going to do it. It is 3 p.m. I've got to finish it. So, um, okay, so hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts for the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So our hope is in God. Um, let me give you three things to think about before I let you go. When does pressure have power over you and me? When the pressure comes, how does it have power over us so we can be aware that we're not going to let pressure have power over us? We instead, we're going to be worshippers of God. The first thing is, there's a refusal to admit that you need help. If you, if you cannot admit you need help, I've spoken about this already, it's actually pride. Then you're saying, I don't need anybody and I don't need God. Then pressure's just going to have the power over you. We do not bow to pressure. The second thing is, you've got your mind made up. When you've got your mind made up about how things are going to work and how things should be, and you set in your ways and you say, uh, you know, this has happened before and it's just going to happen again. There's a refusal. You, you know, you've got your mind made up. Then the pressure is going to have power over you. The only, the only way to deal with that is to renew your mind by the Word of God. Start thinking. Finding out how God thinks. Start thinking the way He thinks. And then we can overcome the pressure. The other one is a refusal to believe word over facts. So you have all the facts about the healing that you need. You've done your research on Dr. Google and you know exactly what Dr. Google said is going to happen with your body and you refuse to believe what the word says because when you read the word it sounds too simple that it says, by the stripes of Jesus I've been healed. He sent his word and healed me. And you, you'd rather believe what the doctor says. So pressure will have its way with you until you get to the place where you say, Lord, I'm going to believe your word instead. I feel the pain. I feel the symptoms. I know this is happening, but this is what your word says. I've had to do that many times, and I've seen God come out stronger than the lies of the enemy. And um, so, okay, so I was going to tell you about the woman at the well, but I won't do that. Let me give you this. When... In Ephesians 4, where it says the fivefold ministry equips the saints for the work of the ministry. Um, let me read it to you. I've got to give you this. I'll add it into my bite sized version. Ephesians 4. The saints equipped the, for the work of the ministry, so we all come to maturity and um, the stature of Christ. And you know what it means, the stature of Christ? What he looks like. Um, so when you're being equipped to, um, to do the work of the ministry, to be mature, um, and to come to the fullness of the stature of Christ, you're being equipped so that you will look like him and you will think like him, you'll speak like him, you'll act like him, you'll have faith like him, you'll have faith in him. That's what equipping is meant to do. And so when you are getting teaching that is speaking to you about your identity, about the stature of Christ, that's your identity. If you can see that you have been made to be built into the stature of Christ, to look like him and to be like him, to think like him, you will not put up, you won't bow to the pressure of the enemy. You'll say, there's no way. Jesus never bowed to any pressure from the enemy. When the, he was sent into the wilderness, um, he overcame the enemy saying, it is written. So the best way to deal with any kind of pressure in your life, it is written. Get the word out. Don't fall into the trap of thinking. This is, a, this is another thing where pressure will have power over you. 
You believe that God sent the pressure so you can learn to grow. Nope, he doesn't do it that way. It's like you as a parent withholding food from your kids so they will learn to have faith in you to, as their provider. Some people get that. It's just weird. We wouldn't do it as natural parents, so why would God withhold from us so we could learn to have faith in him? No, he shows us his goodness. He gives us everything we need in the word. We have the spirit of God. We have an anointing on our lives. We have authority in the name of Jesus. And we are called to overcome because of that. And in times of pressure, it's opportunities to grow and say, God, I know. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to boast in you. And I'm going to see you come through. So we've gone five minutes over time. Bettina Morris, I see you here. Rosemary Sutton, you bear. Good to see your names. Michelle Doralingo, hallelujah. Yep, the pressure is on the Lord. M Michelle, exactly. And we want to take it all on ourselves and think we can do a better job than God. We have to learn to cooperate. Marianne Anderson, thank you so much. I love it when I see you posting the scriptures up here, just to make sure that I'm preaching the right stuff. Um, Pietro Pelé, good to see you. Sandy, I am glad you are encouraged. Um, Sharon Wingfield, amen. Lord, I pray for Sharon for that, against that fatigue. Don't pray for fatigue. Against that fatigue. If the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in Sharon, he will quicken her mortal body. So I pray, Lord, for a quickening of her body, a turnaround for strength, for energy, re reviving and revitalization in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Janine, so glad. Maria Boven, good to see you. And Fontini, thank you for tagging people. Leona Moss, so good to see you. All the way from down under. Um, okay, I see we've got more people there, but I will greet you in the comments. And I will see you all soon. Tomorrow there is a bite-sized word coming. And I'll let you know for the time on Thursday. I've got something happening in the morning, but I'll let you know. It'll either be early or later. So thank you so much for joining me today. I preach myself happy again. And remember, God is looking for people who will carry weight in the Spirit, and that's you, because of Jesus and what he's done. So thank you so much. I'll see you soon again. Bye. Thanks for joining today's session. I hope you were equipped, empowered, and encouraged today by what you heard. Remember, you can find all the live video sessions that you may have missed on this page, on the Facebook page, Kathy Moll Ministries, or on YouTube, Kathy Moll on YouTube. You can also find all the other resources on kathymoll.com.